Morning everyone, welcome to our SEAC webinar. Today we will be presenting on AB 2188, SEAC's recommended practice on single inspection guidelines for small residential rooftop solar energy systems. Today's presentation will be one hour and 30 minutes. We will start with our speaker's presentations and we'll end with a Q&A. We recommend and encourage all of you to please type your questions and submit them to us during the course of the webinar. Questions will be addressed at the end of the webinar during our 30-minute Q&A session. We, oh, sorry. Um, please be advised that the presentations and the recording of today's webinar will be shared by email to all registered attendees within the next 24 hours. All right, moving on to our introductions. My name is Paula Mellon. I am the SEAC Administrator. I will be your moderator for today's webinar. And yes, when you look at the definition of happiness in the dictionary, that is the picture you see. Our speakers today are Hector Borders. Hector Borders is the SEAC project lead. He is also the Assistant Deputy Director, Building and Safety Division, County of Los Angeles Department of Public Works. Hector will introduce SEAC, the organization, its formation, our progress, and our very ambitious and noteworthy goals. Sparky Cohen. Sparky Cohen is the building official of City of Calabasas. Sparky will be discussing the importance of embracing newer outlooks and a needed paradigm shift regarding methodologies of inspectors in the context of the single combination inspection process of small PV systems. And Don Hughes. Don Hughes is the codes and standards specialist for the CSE, Center for Sustainable Energy. Don will outline our process, purpose, and key recommendations in streamlining single inspection as mandated by AB 2188. And without further ado, please welcome Hector Borders. Well, good morning. I thank you, Paula, for the introduction. This is a really exciting day because this is I believe it's the first time that many of you out there uh, are hearing about the Solar Energy Action Committee. Uh, this is a, a very exciting endeavor that was initiated by the County of Los Angeles Department of Public Works and the, we're the lead in, in facilitating. And so what, what is the Solar Energy Action Committee? Well, this is a, a group of we, what we believe are experts in the industry, um, truly leaders that have a wealth of knowledge and experience and these folks come from all over California and some from outside California. And the reason we want to bring these folks together is, is to um, look at a lot of the challenges that are in, impacting industry. And when I talk about industry, I mean that everybody, both the public and private sector, and look to see what's preventing solar from, from growing. And, and there's a, a, a lot of different things. And as the county, we, we we were looking at some of our own challenges, uh, everyday operational issues and code issues and, and regulations and many, many different things. We say, wait a second, you know, th those issues that are impacting us impact everybody else. So we thought that putting a committee together to solve some of these problems will help all of the industry. And there's tremendous challenges out there. And I'm sure that many of you are aware of those every day, whether you're a jurisdiction or installer, manufacturer, testing lab, a utility, et cetera. You know, you face many different things and, and there's just misunderstandings and there's process issues. And, uh, and, and that has ultimately an impact on somebody that wants either solar on the roof or they want to build something much bigger, you know, commercial scale solar, utility scale solar project. So, so what are some of the things that we're looking at right now? Uh, AB 2188, um, for those of you in California, you're probably very familiar with AB 2188. That's a legislation that was recently, recently approved and never has very specific requirements to impact both uh, the jurisdictions and impact installers and others. And so we're looking at that very specifically and one of the things we're going to talk about today is single inspection. And you think that, wow, that should be so simple, it should be just common sense. But when you get into it, it's a lot of misunderstandings and misconceptions and how do you do it? Oh my God, you mean I can't do a progress inspection? So how do we do that and make it effective? UL 2703, this is a standard that's evolving right now. <clears throat> and, and you'd be surprised how many questions there are regarding UL 2703, even what is the standard? What does it mean? 
You know, how, how does it get applied? What's a listing certification? What are the installation instructions and how should I, I, I use those? So there's a lot of questions regarding UL 2073 and there's been some awesome discussions regarding that. Interconnections. So I'm a homeowner, everything's installed, ready to go, and I'm sitting there waiting for somebody at utility to hit the switch and so I can start using the brand new system. And sometimes that, that takes weeks, months, and there's different perspectives as to why that's happening from both the utility side and from the installer side and the, and the owner. And so we're trying to break that down and, and, and come up with ways to solve that problem, make it faster. We're also looking at developing a manual uh, guidelines for utility scale solar uh, to help projects get built quicker, cheaper, um, and just and to bring in more solar in, in, into our community to help it grow and ultimately, ultimately in um, safely. So we're dealing with day-to-day -day issues and uh, and and how how does that work? Well, these, these, these folks that we brought together, they're installers, they're jurisdictions, they're manufacturers, they're utilities, they're um, testing labs. So we cover a uh, broad range of folks from all over the industry. They are an amazing group of folks that have really broken down some communications barriers and having some very difficult discussions on how to solve a lot of these, a lot of these uh, problems. And they're very motivated and motivated with coming up solutions. And some of them are already on our, on our website. We call it recommended practices. And we encourage you to take a look at this. Let your colleagues know. And we hope that the, the solutions are so compelling that you will use them and, and implement them. So this started as a, as a simple idea as, to, hey, let's get a bunch of folks together. Let's communicate and break down some problems. And it has grown tremendously. Um, there's more and more things that, that the Solar Energy Action Committee is going to tackle and more is being asked of it. So uh, we, we hope that you guys out there and, and your friends and colleagues would um, join us, would get engaged through our meetings. Uh, all our meetings are open to anybody in the industry, and they're also online. So you can join online just like in this webinar. And make, a use, of, make use of the information and share your ideas, share your, your positions, so we can then take, take that, you know, have some good discussions, uh, come up with some recommended practices so that we all benefit. Because I believe that ultimately we all want to find, figure out how to make this thing work better for all of us and, and make, make it better for our community so we can put more installations out there. And with that, I thank you um, for listening. Thank you, Hector. We now open the floor to Sparky Cohen to present on single combination inspection process for small PV systems and Welcome, Sparky. That really is his name. Hey, hello, everyone. I started as a combination building inspector in 1989. For 17 years, in some way, shape, or form, I was in charge of uh, all the inspections for a city. Um, and pr primarily due to my cu customer service philosophies, uh, I started in Calabasas in 2006. In a nutshell, everything I'll be talking about today is simply related to that uh, philosophy. What is a small PV system? This is very basic, I know, but let's make sure we're all on the same page. Installations with roof-mounted photovoltaic PV panels, systems rated 10 kW and less, and they're limited to one and two family dwellings. What happened? Why are we here today? California elected officials responded in force to the solar stakeholder community. This, isn't ha this hasn't been creeping up on us. It's been coming like a freight train. I don't know how many, but several building departments, also known as AHJs or authorities having jurisdiction, made a mess of things with horrible customer service. That's the only thing that could have happened here. Why are we here? Well, we can start off in 1978 with the Solar Rights Act. 2007, California Solar Initiative. September 25th, 2012, we had an assembly bill uh, limiting permit fees. September 27th, another Senate bill. You know, at this point today, 
these warnings should have been loud and clear. Also in 2012, the Sierra Club published this report. The report was very critical about building apartments, solar fees, and practices. They contacted many local city council members about AHJ service complaints. And no building official wants to have to respond to a city council member questioning the customer service of their department. But they also took the time to reach out to state the local state elected officials. All these bold warnings, yet AHJs still really weren't responding. The pressure was consistent. If building departments didn't get the message that customer service was paramount, this, was, this report, sponsored by the Sierra Club, should have made that clear. Again, state elected officials and many local city council members were contacted with service complaints. The warning signals could not have been any louder. Here was the result of the outcry. AB 2188 was signed by our governor. Expedited solar permitting laws and the solar permitting guidebook are now mandatory for every AHJ in the state of California. There are many, but of these new mandates, none was a greater punch to the stomach of building officials than the mandatory single building inspection requirement. California solar guidebook, to me, this can be summarized in two words. Again, customer service. No matter what type of AHJ process we have, whether it's a permit for a swimming pool, a patio, or a high-rise building, an AHJ should not have a moving goalpost. We have to have transparency to everything we do. We also need to strive for consistency. I mean, that's why we have our ICC local chapters. Anyone who goes to those, we're going because we want consistency. Also, a desired outcome. And the goal of AB 2188 really, in essence, is to force building apartments to shorten the critical path of the construction timeline as it relates to administering small PV permits. AB 2188, a name which will live for many more years to follow, but really, we should start referring to it as Government Code 65850.5, and it has a very specific and very direct mandate. And expert, uh, excerpts of those are as follows. For a small residential rooftop solar energy system eligible for expedited review, now here it is, only one inspection shall be required, which shall be done in a timely manner. Now a lot of you know out there, look at those words, shall. That's a very specific meaning to building and safety, uh, that's a very firm word. Look at this other passage. If a residential rooftop energy system fails the inspection, now the next sets of inspections don't have to conform to this requirement anymore. We are allowed to do reinspections. To me, they fall back into the typical process at that point. I'm in a unique area in Calabasas, and although we're an LA County-based jurisdiction, we're very close to Ventura County and jurisdictions that are also within the Santa Monica Mountains. So I regularly participate in meetings for both chapters. I happen to be the inspection committee chairman for both chapters, and both the committees were uh, directed by their chapters to analyze the single inspection challenges posed to combination of inspectors related to Assembly Bill 2188. Our, our, our committees surveyed inspection staff of numerous AHJs. We're talking about over 100 of them. Our results revealed education is required, and so far I think we're doing a great job in those regards. But we also determined advanced technology and new methodologies should be embraced. And look what we're doing today, this webinar. We, we have near 200 people, and I have no idea where you're at. Um, there's just so many things we could be doing. Here's the big ticket issues our committee is working on. All right. First, you have to understand and utilize workmanship as a tone setter for the inspection. We need to focus our attention on big picture requirements of the code. 
and we don't want to inadvertently approve existing unlawful construction. The Joint Committee is uh, also recommending some other things. When we perform mandatory inspections, as described in Chapter 1 of the Building Codes, don't access roofs unless the pitch is 12 and 4 or less. And, of course, it's a safe, non-damageable surface, such as rolled asphalt or asphalt shingles. And something that's very new, and we all are uh, supporting this, using photographs to aid the inspection process for difficult to access or concealed work. Now, we're not saying photographs would replace an inspection. It's a supplement. It's a, it's a tool to help facilitate the inspection. Here's our current codes, California Code of Regulations, Title 24. And uh, for all you combination inspectors out there, or for all you other people, you really need to know a combination inspector's knowledge is just substantially underrated. Look at all they have to understand. There's so many codes and there's so many different laws. However, our job's never been to memorize them. Our job's to master the art of research and making sound decisions afterwards. And of course, it certainly makes for better decisions when the history and intent of the codes is understood. Required inspections and code provisions. These are minimum standards. They're not quality control guidelines. Required inspections. This is a great spot as an example of some history and intent. I really find this amazing. We're looking at near 90 years of required inspections. Look at this. The 1927 Uniform Building Code and the required inspections. Uh, 2013 building codes, they're still relatively the same. A paradigm shift we should emphasize is that year after year, building departments are performing more and more inspections, but in reality, they're not code mandated. Required inspections, California Residential Code, section 905.3.3. Does this mandate an underlayment inspection? Absolutely not. California Residential Section 905.3.8. Is a roof flashing inspection required? <laughs> Absolutely not. We just don't need to be doing these. Again, California Residential Code 109.4, frame inspection. Uh, this really gives us the ammunition to embrace AB 2188 and the single inspection process. The intent has never been to subject construction process to uh, excessive scrutiny. 109.4 mandates all rough work would be complete for the frame inspection of a new dwelling. That's really the intent. An installation of a small PV system should not be subject to Section 109.4 criteria. My opinion, and I can't emphasize this enough, this could be a four-hour topic right here. Okay, this is a fact. Most contractors simply adhere to an inspector's direction to avoid lengthy arguments and more delays. However, if you're an AHJ with combo inspectors running roughshod on proven applicants, you may eventually face a civil complaint. And when you do, they'll be seeking a ton of money. That watermark you see here on the screen, this is a real case. They were seeking attorney's fees, court costs, and those alone would have been very expensive. And they were also seeking $350,000 in damages. Right. What is malfeasance? Performance of an act that is legally unjustified, harmful, or contrary to the law. What's misfeasance? The wrongful performance of a normally lawful act. The new law mandates a single inspection. Do not encourage your contractor to provide an in-process in or rough inspection. You're really putting yourself at risk. Access to work. 
this is really important, and I think a, a really germane topic, invasive inspection. Should inspections require the removal of electrical components? A destructive inspection. Should an inspection require the removal of building material? Should we be having them pull off drywall to verify some wiring that was existing behind a wall? Many successful and proactive contractors are already doing this. They're photographing and videoing their installations throughout the construction process. They're usually doing it to protect themselves from unjust claims. So why not promote the process? If their photos are for some reason questionable to an inspector, have the contractor take it additional on-the-spot photos. We do have smartphones. This is a no-brainer. I'm looking at eight devices in this room. We could take pictures for days. Inspectors, you're setting the tone for your entire department. Whether you're the first human contact they've had or the last, if you're not customer service oriented, you just tarnish the credibility of your entire team. You should not be in this business if you don't like people. This is a must. You have to be courteous. You have a smile on your voice. When somebody calls you, does it sound like you're happy and eager to speak to them? Do you have a smile on your voice? Are you approachable? Are you, are you supportive? Do you have a can-do attitude? Understand customer goals and make them a reality. Look for a reason to say yes. It's pretty easy to say no. Receptive and responsive. Time is money. Give inspection times. Promptly return your phone calls and emails. You have to be flexible. Facilitate practical decisions when code intent is achieved. This watermark <laughs> represents another real case, a long drawn out code enforcement case with hundreds of hours of city prosecutors' time, a couple thousand hours of our time, and although we prevailed in all counts we alleged in our filed criminal case, we would have pursued another major count, but due to inspector's tunnel vision, we didn't include it in our complaint. When I say existing construction, I'm talking about big picture issues. Example, did the building the inspector just visit, um, did it ever have a permit in the first place? Another example, does the only building permit in the file, the home, uh, describe a one-story, 1,000 square foot, conventionally framed structure, and all of a sudden, unknowingly, the inspector walked the roof of a 3,000 square foot, two-story home. What's our best defense in these regards? It's so simple. The inspector should review the existing permit records before they visit the job site. Okay, what is an estoppel or detrimental reliance on document or action argument? Take the examples I just read. If we have an inspector approve a PV system on these structures, down the road, no matter what caveats or disclaimers you have on your paperwork, that property owner can allege they relied on the inspector's action, and they're asking the court to stop you from your enforcement. And these arguments get substantially stronger every time the home changes hands from that point on. I, I, I live by this motto. I say this over and over. I'm like a broken record. My staff is sick, sick to death of hearing it. But I'm going to keep telling it to them and I'm going to keep preaching it. What's our primary goal as an AHJ? There it is. There's our bullseye. It's the protection of human life. Look, if a building falls down, I hope it met the codes, and I hope it fell down slow enough to let everyone get out in time. If a building catches on fire, I hope we used the right materials, and it didn't burn down at the ground before the occupants could escape and or the fire was extinguished. Homes are replaceable, people are not. This is our bullseye, folks. A building permit applicant has a right to 
build the most horrific looking and functioning structure as long as it meets the minimum of the code. Quality control does not equal customer service. An inspector is not a quality control agent, and that's certainly not uh, an inspector is not a quality control agent, and it's certainly not part of AHGA customer service. Push your bad slide, sorry guys. Robotic enforcement of the building codes. Sorry, it does not equal a good strategy to achieve the primary goal of our building codes. Sooner or later, we need to say yes. Uh, how much aggravation do we want to put them through in between? Uh, robotic enforcement, citing everything you could possibly find, uh, isn't going to make the building any better. It's not going to make it any safer. Uh, it simply just makes everybody more aggravated. This is important. The indisputable threat to human life due to the presence of a PV system is firefighters at risk due to the presence of the system. Look, we've had a few fires documented, documented that started due to a faulty PV system, sure, but not many. The unquestionable biggest hazard is that if a home is on fire and there happens to be a PV system on the roof, our firefighters are at risk. Again, robotic enforcement of the code will never change this fact. Uh, we sure wouldn't be taking our code books with us out to our inspections, reading them sentence by sentence, and then confirming compliance to each of those statements in the field. And on that note, checklists, they're very, very useful. I do, do see the benefit in checklists. And we have a very good one in the solar guidebook. But that being said, checklists just don't replace an inspector's common sense. This is a barometer that starts at Toma of the inspection and its workmanship. Contractors, you can do yourselves no better a favor than having staff that has been well trained. Right? Good or poor workmanship, that should set the tone of your inspection. Good workmanship should result in an inspection that's shorter in time than that of an inspection with poor workmanship. Good workmanship, good access, and good photographs that should result in inspection with a very short duration in time. A workmanlike matter. What, what are we talking about here? I, I can tell you what it meant to me when I showed up on a job site. All right. If I didn't even get out of my truck and I saw this construction crew on your job site, uh, my red flags were going up. Chances are I'm going to be a little more detail-oriented on my inspection. Well, if I see these kind of guys on a job site and, and they're your trained crew, my red flags are going up. I'm going to be more detail oriented. Now, if I pull up to your job site and, again, I'm barely getting out of the truck and these are the work trucks I see on the job site, my comfort level is getting pretty high. It really is. I, I've got a good feeling about it. I see the professionalism. professionalism I believe my inspection is going to go pretty quick. Uh, look at this. Uh, on your left-hand side, poor workmanship, poor wire management. If that's what I'm seeing when I show up on a PV system, my comfort levels are pretty low. But if what I see is over here on the right, that's nice work. I think we're going to get through this a little quicker. Uh, Poor workmanship, again, the picture on our left. If I see a kink like that in conduit, I know I had a knucklehead out there bending conduit, and it might have been his first time. Where the heck was that guy's training? How in the world can you put a piece of conduit like that on the wall? Picture on the right, I see that. I see installations with somebody who took their time to make very nice bend uh, in the conduit. Yes. Yeah. My comfort level is sky high. That's all I have, guys. Thanks for listening. I appreciate it. I'll turn it back over uh, to Hector and Don. Thank you, Sparky. 
We will be opening the floor shortly to Hugh, uh, Don Hughes to present on streamlining the single inspection process. We're busy switching over now. Welcome, Don. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Get this fired up here. So the single inspection process is uh, it's, it's pretty much what Sparky talked about, but it's also it's also an attitude that you have to have to uh, towards towards completing the single inspection process. So. Let me tell you who I am, what I do, and then we'll, we'll get into the single inspection process and the recommendations made by the SEAC. So my name is Don Hughes. I'm the Codes and Standards Specialist for the Center for Sustainable Energy and the former Chief Electrical Inspector for the County of Santa Clara, California. I've uh, been involved with solar for over 10 years and done merit reviews and, and private consulting in, in, in solar permitting. So the Center for Sustainable Energy, we are a nonprofit organization and we are not lobbyists or an enforcement agency. We just promote solar and sustainable energy. We're, we're helping to accelerate the transition to a sustainable world through clean energy. So AB 2188 does require that, that the AHDA perform a single inspection. It is the intent of the assembly bill for the inspection office to go out of their office with the intentions to do a single inspection. In other words, like Sparky said, it, if you find corrections, then of course you're going to have to go back and verify those corrections, or or you may be able to let them fix them. Then we'll talk about that in a second. So, but but it's the intention of the jurisdiction to go out and complete the inspection process in a single inspection. In other words, they don't have it written in their documents that you have to perform a rough inspection for the attachments and a flashing inspection and a and a fire marshal inspection. They should intend to go out of their office and complete this process with one single final inspection. That was the intention of the assembly bill when it was written. It applies to PV and salt water or uh, solar water heating systems for PV systems less than 10 kW that are rooftop installations and solar thermal 30 kW and less that are rooftop installations on the roof of an existing single family dwelling or uh, or attached garage or something like that, or single, pretty much single family properties. They're for string inverters, microinverters, and DC converters, or, or what they call power optimizers. That's a DC-DC converter. And they comply with the eligibility for the checklist. Um, I'll probably touch on a few things that Sparky did, but we just left them in here because we felt they were important enough to go over twice. And one of the things that, that, that Sparky didn't touch on is the the, the wording of the single inspection requirement is found in the body of the law, the 685.50 section in the law says that systems that would qualify must perform a single inspection. That's actually outside of the, the, the AB 2188. It's in the body of the law. So, so in a jurisdiction that has not even adopted a streamlined permitting process to be in compliance with with AB 2188, they're still required by law to perform a single inspection on systems that would qualify for that. There's a bunch of stuff in the law that, that affects housing and, and, and the, the legal aspects that are, that are regardless or irregardless of whether or not the jurisdiction has actually adopted a streamlined process which should be enforced. The bill does state that if correction items are observed that they have, they're perfectly acceptable. Again, Sparky touched on that. So that's saying if I go out and I have observe correction items, then, then I need to make you fix those. And my criteria is kind of on one hand. It, you know, is it going to burst into flames, leak deadly gases, become energized, fall down and hurt somebody, or, or, or come off the roof, or come back to haunt you? That's, that's the things that the jurisdiction should be looking for, not like, you know, looking for petty reasons to write corrections. That, if you want to lord over somebody, you have a kid or a dog or something, don't, don't take it out on your customers in the field if you, if you need to do that. It's I kind of liken it to being a, a highway patrolman, and five different highway patrolmen could pull over the same guy for a broken tail light, and and one guy lets him off with a warning because he believes he's going to go home and fix the tail light, and another guy might do a felony stop and pull him out because he feels it's it's so dangerous it shouldn't be on the road, and he tows the car away. You, you've got to look at every job differently, and, and what level of enforcement you need to to generate to get the to get the problem solved, and and, and what the problem is as well. It, it might be something that could easily be corrected. 
and that's that, that that's where we're at. Is if a if an inspection generates only minor corrections, then then it's far better economically speaking for the jurisdiction and the installer and the homeowner to not have to schedule to come back out. When the when the jurisdiction finds corrections and and the person who's standing inspection is capable of it, they should allow the the contractor to take that five or ten minutes to fix it because you may be in a hurry today, but adding a call to your to your job that could have been resolved in five minutes today means at least forty five minutes tomorrow, let alone the correction notice that you've got to write. So it's just beneficial to everybody to try to find a way to resolve minor corrections today, and that is by changing a breaker or changing a labeling or or, or whatever it is that, that satisfies the inspectors need to know that you're going to fix that. So eventually it, it boils down to relationships between the installer and the, the inspector to, so that they have the confidence to know that, that the guy says he's going to do something and he does it. But you want to eliminate the travel time and eliminate that snowballing effect of, of PV systems being rolled over to the next day and hopefully this will blossom into all calls that, that we need to figure out a way to manage the load the workload that the building departments are, are picking up with green building and WUI and, and all of the different things, part Title 24, Part 6, Energy Code, and you just don't have the time to do everything, so we've got to figure out how to mitigate some of these uh, return calls, and, and that is to figure that it's easier to spend five minutes today than it is a half an hour tomorrow. The most important factors in completing a single inspection process are definitely attitude, communication, and preparation. It's, uh, it's in the best interest of everyone for the AHJ to be able to perform this single inspection on uh, on these PV systems. It's actually the intent of the law that, that, that you intend to try to mitigate costs. That's in, in, in part of the bill as well, that, that let alone the, the streamlined process, that you that you as the AHJ have the full intention of minimizing and mitigating the, the unnecessarily hurdles and unnecessary costs. So. It's not an unnecessary cost to have somebody come back and do something that's unsafe. That is absolutely acceptable. But there are minor things that should be allowed to be fixed at the time. And having the attitude that it's more economically effective is a key factor. It's also important for the AHGA to communicate all of their expectations in advance so that the contractor knows what the expector is going to be looking for in order to sign the final. If you go out there and you don't have a clue what, what City A requires and you know what City B requires, a lot of times that's happening. The installers are going out there and they're saying, listen, City B is the, the measure by, by which we go by because they're the toughest and then all of a sudden City A has some other requirements. So what we're trying to do is get everybody on the same page to have the same requirements and to clearly articulate those clients, those, those, those uh, requirements somewhere on a, on a publicly accessible website or, or somehow articulate those to your customer in advance so that they have a better stand, stand a better chance of passing the single inspection. So the elements of a streamlined inspection, this is right straight out of the state PV permitting guidebook. A single final inspection is coordinated among all agencies, AB 2188. Other recommendations from the guidebook are that the jurisdiction use a concise inspection checklist that they enable inspection requests over the phone, or online, email, or by fax to provide electronic services. That they provide for on-site inspection during the next business day. And it says in the guidebook where, where possible in no more than five days. So the requirement is that you shoot for substantial conformance with this guidebook. So substantial conformance means what? I mean, if I was told to swim across the ocean and I got 100 yards, that's about as far as a old guy like me could swim. So I was in substantial conformance. I, I probably drowned, but I did my best. But substantial conformance means you try your best. You try your best to be in conformance with this. And if, if you're a small jurisdiction with one person doing plan checks and then going out and doing inspections and, and you just can't possibly meet that same day or even no more than five days requirement, you probably wouldn't get to take into task if you did it in six days and could verify that you know this, this is what it takes. So that's substantial conformance. You try, you try as hard as you possibly can to meet these minimum requirements and to provide these services so that we can facilitate the rapid adoption of uh, the widespread adoption of solar PV and uh, getting our goal of, of meeting a, accelerating the, the transition to a sustainable world from clean energy. 
So provide a scheduling time window for on-site inspections of no more than two hours. Uh, that's that's not that difficult, really. But let me go back one, and uh, it may include no, may include notification of the utility on successful completion. That's up to each jurisdiction. Uh, some jurisdictions communicate with the utilities, and some don't. So some jurisdictions are turning to new permitting inspection tools like online processes. There's actually jurisdictions out there that are that are entertaining virtual inspection. I believe uh, one of the California jurisdictions, maybe San Bernardino, has a, a process where they allow virtual inspections. I don't know what that consists of. I imagine it has something to do with uh, video technology and, and sending them in a, a picture of it. And when we were teaching this class recently, people said, oh, no way would I allow that. And I said, well, what if you had one little thing that, that wasn't attached? And the guy said, hey, I'll, I'll send you a picture of that first thing in the morning. I think it's perfectly acceptable to accept virtual technology and photographs and basically the the term approved in the California Electrical Code Book or the NEC even in, in Article 100 says approved is defined as being acceptable to the authority having jurisdiction. So it really is up to that building inspector on every case to determine what what level it's going to take to prove to him that you that you've been code compliant and. Typically, when it comes to photographic documentation that I've been involved with over the years as a as an electrical inspector and a chief electrical inspector, I've even let people photograph things at you know technology labs at Stanford University because I couldn't have access for some reason. But you know, there's technical aspects of things that you can do. But the bottom line is, it's up to each inspector to say, yeah, I can accept that, and they don't even take the pictures with them. They look at the picture and they sign the card and they say per photograph. So really, they don't even have the, the photograph to cover their proverbial cover their their butt. They really just wanted something to to give them some assurances. So that's where we're at. Except, a, I mean, you get on an airplane and fly. At some point, you've got to trust somebody. So if you're trusting that pilot, and, and at some point, you've got to trust the homeowner and the, the contractor to tell you that, that they did these things and that these photographs were taken on site. So by creating the checklist and the processes for performing a single inspection and communicating them to the installers, the jurisdiction is going to benefit from that. They're going to benefit from not needing to return for follow-ups because you made it clear what it was that you were going to be looking for. So if you don't communicate those expectations and you show up on the job site and nothing's done right, or at least to your, to your expectations, and I guess you're your disappointments are directly proportionate to your expectations. So communicate the expectations. That way when you show up on the job site, the person's done, and you go, wow, look, you did everything I wanted. And, and, and that's pretty simple because you told me what you wanted in advance. So SEAC has uh, the Solar Energy Action Committee. This is a group, and nobody really explained that, but this is a group of like leading experts in this field, the, the the list of people who's on this group of SEAC, the Solar Energy Action Committee, reads like the list of people who are involved with the State of California PV Permitting Guidebook. It is the leading AHJs. Uh, I know Pete Jackson from Bakersfield. You have Mustafa Cache from LA. You have so there was a lot of AHJs on this, and things in this presentation that say you know when we asked what is acceptable to the AHJ, that's not. That's not a solar contractor asking that question or saying this should be acceptable to the AHJ. This is us asking each other. This is AHJs asking AHJs, what should we accept? So this group fully vetted this, and, and we had UL involved, and we had installers involved, and it was represented just like a UL standards technical panel committee represents things. I'm personally on all of the, the UL STPs for solar photovoltaics from 1703 all the way up to 8703, and for energy storage and everything. So these the people on these committees that are actually involved in this stuff pretty heavily for years and years. So SEAC is the group that vets things that we say, how should we do this? And now we're coming out with recommendations. And, and here's the recommendations that SEAC has in regards to our first question, which was, what should be jurisdiction? What should be considered sufficient to the authority having jurisdiction in order to comply with the single inspection requirements of AB 2188? So we looked at this question, we ran it by some focus groups, and we drafted some final recommendations. And this is what they said. So all California jurisdictions are mandated by the state of California to uh, create an expedited PV permitting process. And that was 
required to have been done by September, and in that process they were required to do the single inspection. So this is actually a photograph of the bill. It says only one inspection shall be required. Again, Sparky went over this, so it's a little redundant. When it comes to trying to educate the masses, it is kind of the Department of Redundancy Department, and we gotta, we got to make sure that people understand what they're looking at so that it makes it easier. So SEAC has identified uh, successfully some single inspection procedures that are currently in, in use. These aren't things that SEAC made up. These are things that the group vetted and looked at a bunch of stuff that people were doing, and some of it was a little, a little far-fetched, and we didn't put it in our document here. But some of the stuff was very acceptable to all of the AHJs, and we went back and forth. And ultimately, these things were acceptable to a group of AHJs and installers and manufacturers and uh, standards developers. So, so these should be acceptable to the people on this line. And, and if anybody has any questions about it, by all means, give me a call. We'll give you some links at the end, and we'll try to explain how we came to these conclusions. So the objective of the recommendations is to facilitate system approval in a single inspection. And not just to have the intention of doing a single inspection, but to actually have the desire to, and the tools to be able to complete a single inspection. So many of the solutions just require a greater education and relationship and communications of expectations between the AHJ and the installer. So recommendation list is about is about nine items. So the, so number one on the list was that the installer should ensure that a qualified individual who is familiar with the applicable codes and installation procedures be on site at time of inspection to provide access to systems and components and to answer questions from the inspector. Don't take this picture literally. This was uh, this picture was taken from, I think I got this from uh, NREL Laboratories. I just wanted a picture of a couple people on the roof. I have yet to make somebody lift up a module to inspect underneath the module. I mean, unless they had a J-Box or, or some sort of combiner underneath there, and I had already looked at all of the other J-Boxes and combiners and found them to be less than successful in code compliance, then I would make them open that one as well. But you really don't need to look at 100% of everything as an inspector. We need to look at the first 5 or 10% and, and move on. If, if we were trying to look at everything, we'd, we'd spend the entire day on one job. So our job is to figure out who we're dealing with and what kind of work they do and, and look at some, some pieces and parts of the installation and make sure that those are up, up to code. So number two, access to the roof should be provided to meet the, the latest Cal OSHA guidelines. We went round and round in this and we were going to come up with the standards for that to say it needed to be 30 inches above the roof and strapped down and yada, yada, yada. But with things moving and changing the way that standards do and, and guidelines, we just said do it in do it in accordance with the latest Cal OSHA guidelines and, and what the AHJ expects you to do. So if you show up on the job and the ladder isn't, you know, if you got a six foot ladder and eight and a ten foot roof, that's probably your expectations of passing that inspection on the first go rounder are, are probably unrealistic. Item number three, approved construction documents. This actually should be item number one. The, the, the first thing I ever do when I get out of my car is I ask for the approved plans. Because if you don't have the actual approved plans and the permit on the site, you really can't do an inspection. Everything's based on what's on the approved plans, not a copy of them or, or anything like that, unless it's got a red stamp from the building department. So the approved construction documents and installation instructions. Uh, we kind of had some discussions about the installation instructions. Some of the installers said, we provided those for you at plan check, but not really. Um, what gets provided at plan check is, is more plan check documents. It's the specification sheets that really just show the product and the product listing and uh, the basics of you know your, your module uh, short circuit current and your, your voltage and your ISC. That's where we get that information. But as far as how you install things and whether or not a clamping device is listed under UL2703 for grounding with that particular module. That all comes from the installation instructions. So it's really important for you installers to bring the approved documents and the installation instructions for the components that are the inverters, the modules, optimizers, and racking systems because with the development of the standards, it makes it a lot easier for an AHJ to now be really comfortable about the grounding. We don't have to we don't have to go round and round with the installer about whether or not that particular clip or grounding method is approved because if it's approved and it's UL listed, one of the things that the standards 
people do is, is they vet the installation instructions. So a company like Iron Ridge cannot put it in their installation instructions that you can bond a particular module with a particular clamping device unless that was actually built as an assembly, tested that way, and UL has vetted those instructions. So it's a lot easier to perform a single inspection if you just know what all the pieces are that you need to have in your hand. So number four was affidavits. We decided that uh, a lot of jurisdictions are doing it successfully. And uh, people attest to things all the time. And it's just an attestation that, that we decided that if the installer and the homeowner both sign it, the likelihood of somebody trying to cheat this document would be pretty slim. Because for the most part, the homeowner is probably getting something that they didn't know they were going to get in the, in the form of smoke and carbon monoxide detectors that were not in their contract. So the likelihood of them letting the installer off the hook for not installing those smoke detectors they didn't get, know they were going to get is pretty slim. But still, you had an attestation that somebody signed and, and, and certified that they were installing smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. And again, the, the, the likelihood that PV systems actually going to cause a fire is pretty, pretty ridiculous. They, they are more of an impedance to being able to fight that fire. So number five, ongoing training by qualified organizations. This is a recommendation to be able to complete a single inspection without uh, having the ability to understand the codes and the standards and how to install a system or how to inspect a system. Again, the, the expectations of being able to do this in a single inspection is probably not a realistic expectation. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't fly that mission to Mars that just left yesterday, so I wouldn't even try it unless I knew what I was doing. So qualified organizations regarding one inspection process should be ongoing. And we, uh, we think it should be done on a regional basis. People in Texas aren't going to do the same thing that people in California are doing, but the people in California that are abutting communities certainly you should not look at your neighbor's beautiful PV system and be frustrated that you can't get one on your house because of you're in a different jurisdiction. Education is the key, one of the keys. So item number six, the uh, AHDA may adopt specific details on photographic documentation. This, so, so item number six is basically we're saying that, that you should not only accept photographic documentation, but you should create a checklist that say, these are the things that we think that should be inspected or should be photographed to make our life easier as an aid or a tool. That way if you show up and the guy didn't have a, a photograph of a combiner box, you should have articulated to him that, that he should have photographs of all of the combiner boxes. And we've had people say, how, how do I know that it was done on the same site? And that's, that's key too. Is, so how is it done on the same site? Is maybe they can take a little tag and write the job site and the address on it and on a little piece of blue tape or something and stick it to everything they're going to take a photo of or, or, or hold up the permit or whatever the jurisdiction determines in advance and, and articulates to the, to the installer that that's what they would accept and that's important. So CIAC recommends that the HD not only accept photographic documentation for inspection of items not readily accessible but that the inspector, to the inspector at the time, but also they make a list. And we've provided a basic list of things that, that we think should be in, in, in photographed. This list actually, so photographs, actually the first item is this, provide, provide basic guidelines. So, so explain to them that, that photographs shall be of sufficient clarity to demonstrate what exactly is being photographed and she'll have some sort of evidence that the photograph is connected with property and the inspection that they're that they're inspecting. Sorry, I got a little ahead of myself. That's memorized, I guess. So SEAC provided guidelines and a lot of these guidelines came from industry. These all of these photographs which you're about to see came from Sungevity. Thanks to the good people at Sungevity, Alan Fields provided me photographs that they didn't go out and take for our presentation. Sungevity apparently makes it a habit to, to photograph all of these things in advance for their own records and for the, for the exact purpose of showing to the inspector when he comes out there. So this practice is not being generated by an AHGA who developed it. It's being generated in part by the installers who have been successful in, in doing this. So item number one that should be photographed is the PV module. And if you have more than one module, it's module type on the project, then there should be a photograph or a label or a receipt, but this is the photographic documentation. So the photographs, because basically the voltage of the system and the amperage of the system are, rate, are based on what that module can produce. So if, if this module here 
produces 37.47 volts. And the installer was not able to get the modules that, that he showed that he was getting. And he put in a different module. He could put in sun power modules with, you know, 64 volts. So now you you just racked your system up to 1,200 and something volts, which isn't going to work very well. It's going to roast your inverter. So that's why you want to see the uh, photographic documentation on, on what the module is. It gives you the, the module that's on the, on the approved plans, and it gives you all the specifications off of it. Item number two is flashing. So this was a great installation. Sungevity took these pictures. And they're showing that they're putting some sort of product on there. It looks like Cicaflex, and they're tarring that down underneath that clay tile. And I don't think I would have a problem and want to remove any of these products to look at how they flash this if I showed up and they showed me these photographs. Just the fact that they that they documented all this is is, is a key step in, in understanding what kind of person I'm dealing with. They're very meticulous in their photographic documentation. They, they're probably meticulous in their work, like Sparky said about the van. If you could see the guy's lunch on the front of his shirt, he probably does work that way. So item number three is the method of grounding. It's, it's typically up underneath the array or on the roof. Um, a lot of jurisdictions will not get on the roof, or they shouldn't without fall protection if it's over 20 feet high or over 6 and 12. So take a photograph of the method of grounding, and then we can compare it to the approved documents and show that, like the one on the left, is a, it looks like an iron ridge clamp down. Uh, that's a, an approved grounding method under 2703, and so is the one on the right. That's a, just a standard lay and load. Not sure it's stainless, but we'll ignore that for now. So wire management underneath the modules. This this uh, company looks great. They took photographs of the, before they laid the modules down, they took a photograph of the combiner box up on the roof underneath the modules, and they took photographs up underneath the modules to show that nothing is dangling on the roof. Um, this has a time, state on, time stamp and a date stamp. I, you know, I've heard that people don't accept those because they are editable, but again, have them put a little piece of tape or the permit and, and whatever it is that you're going to be willing to accept. But absolutely, photographic documentation saves you from getting up on the roof or, or crawling in an attic or something like that. So speaking of attics, conduit penetrations is number five of the roof system and the inaccessible portions of the structure. So this is a conduit up inside an attic on the right-hand side, and it shows the the DC labeling, which is required on DC uh, conduits that are on the roof and in the attic. It's required to be labeled every 10 feet for caution solar PV. And this flashing uh, with the LV, that looks good. They, they've got photographs of that, so I wouldn't need to jump up on the roof to look at that. Uh, proof of height, typically. This is actually a racking system, but I think it's the photograph is intended to demonstrate that, that conduits are supposed to be raised up off the roof. There's a temperature adder in table 31016B2, I think, that says that you have to add a certain amount of temperature rise to conduits. If, if your conduit's a half inch to three and a half inches above the roof, you may add 40 degrees temperature to that Fahrenheit. So then your conductors might need to be larger because they now need to carry, they can carry less ampacity because they are located uh, where, they're, where they're not supposed to be. So this, this is intended to show you that the conduits are above the roof. Um, here is an attic run conduit again. It just says solar, caution solar circuit. That's really all it's required to say. I, I see a bunch of other stuff, but caution solar circuit. And it's strapped, and it looks like they did a great job. So number eight, all junction boxes and combiner boxes with the covers removed. They should remove the cover and show you them so you can verify that the boxes are grounded, that they've used the right kind of boxes, and that the circuits are properly protected, if that's required for protection. So there's your uh, number nine is any required labels. So marking, labels, anything that's not readily accessible. And again, it's, it's a good idea for the guy to have the camera in his hand. So the, 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 the person who's standing inspection should have the right tools so that he can open anything that you ask him to open. He should have the the ability, the, the know-how, the understanding of the system to, to say, oh, I know, go to that combiner box and he doesn't go that what? So that's kind of part of the problem today is that the inspectors aren't, you know, communicating their expectations and the installers aren't exactly prepared sometimes to be able to understand what the inspector's saying on the field. So if we figure out how to create these relationships and, and, and communicate our expectations and 
provide a little more education. I know when I teach classes, a lot of times I'll ask who's in the room, and it seems like there's one or two installers and the rest say HJs. And I suppose if I was teaching a class for Solar City, it would be the opposite. It would be mostly installers. So I think we need to get together more and, and have have half and half on a regional basis. So if somebody's teaching a class in Ventura County, it should be you know half installer personnel and half inspectors, and then you all go out of the room having the same knowledge. So we need to seek out classes other than you know just our in our internal classes. We should look for you know IAEI and an ICC and some NAPSEP stuff, and we all need to get kind of get on the same page here. So this is the end of my presentation. It's it's applicable to whom? What I just said. It's it's applicable to everybody. The homeowner would benefit. The AHJs would benefit. The contractors would benefit. And the fire department would benefit. I didn't mention it, but part of that in single inspection process is for for jurisdictions that don't already have one to establish an MOU, a a, a memorandum of understanding between the fire service and the the building department to allow the building department to perform the inspections for the fire access and ventilation requirements. That's the sole reason why we got together and codified uh, Section 60511 from the IFC into the California Residential Code. It's in R331.2. It's the exact same language and it's in the building code. We did that so that the building inspectors could have the ability to in inspect for the fire service. They just need to say okay. So if you don't have that, establish that memorandum of understanding with your fire marshal. That will help facilitate the single inspection process. So I gave some links here. SEAC, there's the SEAC uh, website. I believe that's still the correct one. HDPW, LA County. Where's that DWP? Nope, DPW. Uh, Energy uh, Center. Yes. Uh, sorry, Don. It's um, www.ciacgroup.org. Okay, this was old. We, we'll show it at the end. Thank you. All righty. That's the end of my presentation. Uh, anybody's got any questions or anything? We'll be here. All right. So, so thank you, Don. Um, now that was really uh, a great tool belt of valuable practices that many of you will find very useful and beneficial. And Don is going to stay on the line. We are now going to move on to our Q&A session. We have some really great questions lined up here and some really great suggestions as well. So moving on, I will read them out verbatim. Our first one is from Milton. And Milton says, hello, my question is for Sparky. I believe slide about 109.4 or 109.9 my understanding is that a solar contractor does need to inspect the framing structure, but sounds like the inspector doesn't. Is that correct? Here, here's my interpretation of an inspector's responsibility to look at existing framing of an existing roof of a single family home. That's basically where your question is headed. Um, let's first also mention that AB 2188 doesn't just apply to electrical photovoltaic systems. It also uh, is discussing solar thermal systems too. Now if I had a solar water heater panel up on the roof, as an inspector, I'm going to be a little more concerned about the existing framing of that home. Um, I happen to live in an area that sees 90 mile winds frequently. Uh, I live in an area that has a lot of solar panels and they're angled to really catch the wind. I'm not seeing photovoltaic panels flying off the roof. I don't have a huge concern about the existing framing of existing structures. I'm just not going to go into that much detail with my inspection. Now, if I'm on an older home and uh, it, you know, I'm aware that I have two by four rafters spaced at 36 inches on center, I'm going to be a little more concerned and I'm going to look at that framing a little closer. That's from an inspector's point of view. From a contractor's point of view, Absolutely, you need to be detail-oriented and know exactly 
what you're fastening your, your equipment to. Your, your liability, I don't want to say it's tremendous, but it's certainly of more importance to you than it is to the inspector. Um, does that, and, I, and I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Milton. Moving on to our next question. In fact, it's actually a really good suggestion, and this comes from Dina Behrens. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Are there guidelines to streamline plan check? And I think that, uh, I mean, Sparky, Don, and Hector would probably be able to answer that one. Uh, that's, part of, that's part of AB 2188. That it's, it's in the assembly bill that, that they're supposed to provide a review either over the counter or within three business days if possible. They want, yes. The, the, the AB 2188 is, that's, that's the intent of the law, is to streamline the permitting process, the plan check process for, for qualifying systems. So if you had a ground-mounted system, technically no, there is no, there, there's no law, there's no encouragement, there's no guidelines for that. But for roof-mounted systems on single-family dwellings, it's the intent of AB 2188 that they streamline that over the counter, do it online, or do it within three business days. Would you like to? I'd like to add a little bit to that too, and and Don hits it squarely on the head. This is Sparky, by the way. But the California Permitting Site uh, Guidebook gives you excellent standard plans, and the guidebook is really encouraging every city to have a standard plan that, in my opinion, that closely represents the guidebook, and if not, it's a standard plan that a permit applicant can use while they're sitting at their home and in their office. They fill out your standard plan, and we should expedite those. I mean, the goal is to facilitate them remotely. That, that would be the ultimate way of expediting a permitting plan check. That's not the only way, but that's really the long-range goal of expediting the plan check. Let's put that a different way. That's the law. Perfect. I, you're absolutely right, Don, and, and thanks, Sparky. Uh, for, for my, this is Hector speaking. If you follow the, the guidelines, it, it makes the plan checking so so much easier because everything's there. It's step by step, and and things really a plan check could just take in, take minutes to um, to do. So you know that that's the takeaway here. Follow the guidelines. Do what it says, Sonner. Submit what if you can submit it as close as possible. How it is in that in that guidelines, it just makes things easier. And uh, uh, there's there's Don mentioned software out there. There is some software being developed right now. It's a company called PV Permit Design. And basically, it, it does everything for you. Uh, it designs the system and and in the end, it spits out um, the requirements of the guidelines. So that makes plan checking incredibly easy. And so there's, there's tools out there for, for folks to use. All right, thank you. Moving on to the next, um, I'm not too sure if it, it, it doesn't sound like a question, but it's, um, it comes from Daniel uh, Ruiz, and it states, installers need to be ready for an inspection. I do believe that Don addressed that in his uh, presentation. Um, would you like to elaborate on that, Don? No, I'm not, you really don't need to. I think that installers need to be ready for inspection. That goes for everybody. The, the inspector needs to be ready for an inspection. They both need to have the understanding of what is required for the installation. He's absolutely right. When he's saying that installers need to be ready for the inspection, he's just reiterating what I had said, that a lot of times it's just cheaper to get the guy who is maybe the cheapest guy you got. He, he works in the warehouse, and we have him stand our inspections, and he really doesn't have a clue as far as how the system's installed, he doesn't understand the codes. So being ready for inspection is, is, is item number one on CX's recommendation list, and that is that you have a guy on the site that understands the systems, that, that, that knows how to speak the language, and that has all of the tools necessary to access any piece of equipment. And the reason for that is the inspector is an inspector, which means look and don't touch. Inspectors should never pull out a tool and open a combiner box or a junction box or an electrical service. The code book says you have to be qualified and authorized. And I've been an electrician for over 30 years, but I'm not authorized. I'm qualified to be able to open a panel, but I'm not authorized to. It's actually against the law for me to open up your electrical service or your combiner box. It, it, it shouldn't be done. 
so the installers need to be prepared to, 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 to understand the systems and have the tools to access them and to be able to fix things readily. That's how you're going to get fast inspection. I'll fix that right now. I have the tool. I'll go do it right this minute. Yeah. Another point on that, and uh, me and Don have talked about this before. This is Sparky again. Uh, again, contractors, you can do yourself a big favor. Your inspector doesn't want to feel like your project superintendent. That inspector doesn't want to arrive on your job site uh, for the sole purpose of giving you a punch list to help you figure out how to finish your job. Um, before you call for your inspection, your team, your quality control team, should have already went over that installation with a fine tooth comb. They know it's ready for inspection and have that appropriate person meet your inspector on site. All right, thank you. Moving on to the next uh, question, it comes from David Bertrams. There has been much time given to the concept of not looking for too many corrections. Please provide examples of corrections that should not be written. Well, this is that's an interesting question. Uh, this is Hector. So it's going back to AB 2188 and going back to the guidelines and checklists. The ideal situation is both the inspector and the installer, they have a checklist and it says, hey, th this is the, the important things that we need to take a look at it. And there's some type of agreement early on uh, that, uh, that may be at time of application, there's information available to say, hey, these are the, the, the major things that we're, they're, they're, that we're looking at. So when the installer is there at the, at the inspections, they have a checklist They go, okay, I'm ready for the inspector. The inspector has a similar checklist, so things should match. And they, they match, my gosh, you, that inspect, inspection is going to go so fast. So, so having that understanding and that communication between both the HH and the installers and the contractors, no one was expected. Put it on your website so everybody knows, hey, uh, you're working with, within this jurisdiction, this is what we're looking for. And everybody has a clear understanding of what the practices are uh, within one jurisdiction to another. Ideally, as all jurisdictions and all the installers, we, we all agree and say, hey, this is the best practices and when we, we do an inspection and installation, these are the things that we look for. I'd like to add on to that. This is Don again. So, so the code books are written in black and white, and that's what I mean by it's not the intention to go out there and enforce things in black and white. And a lot of jurisdictions do that. There are inspectors who say that the code book says this. So, so like Romex wiring, for instance, or or your your USC two cables are are both required under the same code, section three thirty four thirty of the NEC, to have the same strapping and mounting support. But I've looked at jobs where where somebody would be within the 18 inches of the box and within four and a half feet, but they got this loop of cable that's like laying on the roof. So he's actually within the code and he's supported within the code, but he's in violation of the code because it's not doing what the code intended. So I would walk on a job and if somebody had their supports 20 inches away from their box and every five feet, but it was nice and tight and it met the intentions of the code, I would sign that off before I would sign somebody off who was actually within the letter of the law. So that's what I'm saying is there are things that inspectors write codes on just because it's written in black and white. But if it's meeting the intent of why the code was written, you don't have to write that. And there's also codes where you can let them fix it right now. Hey, add a strap to that. And, and inspectors will say, I don't have time. I'm not here to sit around while you do that. But that's detrimental for that inspector to have that attitude just because he gets to. It's you're really We're not trying to enforce things by black and white. We're trying to enforce safety standards that are minimum guidelines that are really written because somebody asked, how far apart do I have to strap this? And how, how deep do I have to bury that? So they come up with this magic number, but they're just numbers. And yes, you can push those things if they did it right to meet the intent of what the number represented. That's, that's where a lot of people go wrong is they try to enforce the code in black and white. All right, want to make any comments? No, I'll, I'll leave it at that because we could, uh... Uh, these are hypothetical issues that we could probably take hours on. Mm -hmm. All right, then there's a, another comment that's come through from Daniel Rose, and uh, he mentions drone use. Uh, this is Sparky, I'm from Calabasas, and we actually do have a drone. And uh, if for some reason we found that that drone would be beneficial, I'd have no problem using it. Um, again, with our simple process right now that we're recommending with photographs, uh, 
there's probably no reason for that. Um, but I'd have no issue with using a drone. Yeah, hi, this is Hector. So uh, for those of you that are familiar with this um, website, Indie Agogo, uh, these are a crowdfunding website. Somebody developed a, a, a drone that has a tether on it. And then, so, and then it's control, the controls are very, very simple. The tether means that you don't have to register with the FAA, so there's limitations. But, my gosh, for uh, solar, rooftop solar inspections, or even re-roof, or anything you're putting on, on a roof, uh, what, are, what an idea. So uh, look, look it up in there, and uh, we're actually thinking, trying to find out how, to, how do we buy one of those, uh, just to um, pilot it out, but it's, it's a great idea. All right, thank you. And then moving on to the next question, we have uh, Yoshi Minami. He's asked, can we download these PowerPoint presentations? Uh, yes, we will be emailing them uh, to all of you within the next 24 hours. Um, then our next question comes from Sammy Gantos. Some inspectors are requiring man lift. Is this excessive? Also, if an inspector is about to climb onto a roof without fall protection, should I stop him? Well, what I guess you'd have to say what roof are they about to crawl onto that you would want to stop them because you I mean there are roofs that you can get onto that you would be within within the, the guidelines of Cal OSHA. Technically a building inspector can walk on a roof up to twenty feet uh, adjacent fall to the to the to the ground depending on the roof pitch. And I believe it's as long as it's less than 6 and 12 and it's less than 20 foot fall on a single family roof, you can walk on that without fall protection. Unless there's, there's, some, there's some issues. If somebody's up there with a, with a roofing nail gun and it has a pneumatic hose, that changes, changes everything. And if you're on a tract home, it, it's only 15 feet. And if it's greater than 6 and 12 pitch, it might be 7 and a half feet. So you have to understand the rules of when Fall protection is actually required. Um, right. Typically, I wouldn't want one of our inspectors to walk on a clay tile roof because they may break something or or, or might fall off. But but no, you shouldn't stop them. They're within the within the rights to be able to doing that. As far as the man lift goes, I think that's way excessive. They should be providing you access, and if, if their guys are afraid to walk on ladders, they should probably provide their own man lift. You know, this is Sparky. Let me add to that a little bit. Um, it, it's very clear, it's very direct that the contractor is supposed to provide access to all the work. It's the contractor's responsibility to provide OSHA approved access. Um, and it's also the jurisdiction's responsibility to train their employees to understand what is safe access. So both parties need to understand what safe access is. If an inspector is going to go up on a roof that is not safe, uh, and I was a contractor, I mean, I would probably personally mention that, hey, this, why, why would he be going up on a roof without the OSHA approved access in the first place? Why wouldn't the contractor be providing that? Um, but if the inspector insisted to go up, I, I would certainly make the statement if I was a contractor, I'd, hey, by, by the way, I hope you're aware, uh, that's not an OSHA safe approved access route. Uh, okay, so, sorry uh, to interrupt you, Sparky. And Sammy, is, um, he's uh, elaborated here. Yeah, he said, um, I know I should stop him, but the question is more about how to properly handle that situation. How do we handle these situations how do we escalate something without holding up the job? I'm sure the guy has a supervisor. I don't know that I'd physically try to physically stop somebody. I would warn him not to go out there and do it. And if they did it, I'd call his building official and say, hey, your guy's risking his life and putting my, my homeowner's life insur or insurance policy at risk by doing things that he shouldn't be doing because here's why and be able to elaborate as to why. Here's rule, this rule in Cal OSHA says he shouldn't be walking on this roof and we asked him not to and he did it anyway. He'd probably get in trouble. Yeah, that's a great point, Don. Very, very, very to the issue. All right, then we have another question from Greg Steelhorse. Does the single inspection 
cover new home construction as well? Typically uh, not. Uh, the, the intent is of the assembly bill that it was on single family dwellings that are already constructed. Um, but yes, because you're not going to put that PV system on the roof until the roof is already sheeted, so there should be a single inspection for that PV system, and, and they shouldn't put you through any more ringer than that. But of course, there's going to be multiple inspections that are that are incidental to the to the home and have nothing to do with the PV system. So it it depends on the the, the stage of which you're doing it. If you're installing rough wiring. They may, de they may need a second inspection on that because it, it wasn't installed you know, as, part of the, as part of the building. The building's still under construction, so they may want to look at that incidental item. So I would say kind of all, all bets are almost off if, if, if the house is under construction as far as AB 2188 goes because there's just things that, are, that aren't installed yet. The service isn't even signed off yet. And then there seems to be a suggestion that's coming from Daniel uh, Ruiz. Um, he mentions that he'd like to have two phone numbers. I'm, I'm assuming that uh, Daniel is an inspector. Um, he'd like to have two phone numbers, one for the client and the company, and a time. He says that some companies don't give a time, whether it's in the morning or afternoon. Neither do they provide a phone number in case we're running late. Um, all right, so that's a and uh, and I think that's about that's about the questions that have come in. So I think before we wrap up today's webinar, are there any final comments from our speakers? Um, I'll go ahead and weigh in on what Daniel just said. As far as jurisdictions go, most jurisdictions will not give out the inspectors' cell phones. So the only communication between the inspector and the, the job site is typically done in the morning prior to the, prior to the inspection. So if an installer is running late, that's just uh, that, that's bad planning on their part, and they probably may, they may miss that inspector. And again, most jurisdictions will not give out their inspector's cell phones, or the inspector would just be driving around inundated with cell phone calls all day. So they just don't do that. And as far as get not being able to give you a time, they should be giving you a time. And if they're not, I would try to maybe point that out to that local jurisdiction's uh, city council, their, their city attorney, to say, you guys are in violation of Assembly Bill 2188. You're not providing me a, a, a time window. Um, and this is Barky. I'll add on to Don's point just uh, a tad, too. Um, can you get in the chapter one of the code book and where it tells you uh, to request your inspections, you should be calling in for your inspection when you're already ready for that inspection, not when you anticipate to be ready. So now if you're running late um, and your work, your job's not quite complete, if that's what the question is, uh, to me, uh, that doesn't warrant calling your inspector. Now if the job was complete, um, you call for your inspection and you got stuck in traffic, uh, something like that. I, I still think Don is, is right. That uh, doesn't warrant calling the inspector and now putting him, uh, you know, his route for the rest of the day uh, in a quagmire. So Daniel says that uh, it's if the inspector is running late, I'm guessing he'd like to communicate to, to the uh, contractor or the installer that he, he might be running late? Typically, the installer would call the inspector. I've had people call me all the time in the morning and say, hey, here's my phone number. Or we, they generally put a phone number. Most jurisdictions that I've dealt with, it, it, you put your permit number and your phone number on your request. So the phone number should be on the request from, from the installer. So, so they should put the phone number that they want to be contacted at if the guy's running late. When I worked for the county, we had right on our route sheet, we had the permit numbers, the address, and the phone number, the contact phone number of the person who made the request for the inspection. So if it's different from the, from the one who's making request to the one out in the field, you should call the inspector in the morning and make sure that he has your number in case anything goes wrong. But, but typically, we do have a phone number. It's the one who requested the inspection. Hi, this is, this is Hector. I, I encourage you folks, um, 
and maybe some of you are already doing this, uh, take a look at virtual inspections. The county of San Dino, they did a pilot and it was very successful. So basically the contractor installer or wherever the job site has a smartphone, the inspector can be sitting at a desk and conducting inspections and they can and those things can be scheduled within minutes. Uh, in, in terms of convenience, it's, it's fantastic. And uh, you know, I'm not gonna get into the details how it works, but it's, it's quite simple. You have a smartphone, you shoot video or pictures and the inspector at his computer is seen it live and can direct the installer or the contractor, whoever, to point their phone this way or that way. And it makes things in terms of scheduling and customer service a lot easier and quicker. Obviously, you cannot use it for every single type of job, but hey, you know, go out there and explore uh, and see what the, what the possibilities are. It, this is Sparky. I have one more thing to add. And it, it, I really do think this alone could be a two or four hour topic. But relationships between a contractor and an inspector, we want to nurture those. We encourage those. We're all about customer service. We want to be responsive. A proactive contractor would be calling that inspector in the morning, uh, the day of the inspection, and confirming an inspection window of time. Um, a conscientious inspector is going to actually answer that phone and communicate with the contractor. A real conscientious inspector, and I did this for 17 years, I never had a problem. Yes, I personally gave contractors my cell phone number and I had their cell phone number. If they asked me for a window of time, I didn't give them a four hour window, I didn't give them a two hour window, I gave them an exact time. If they uh, asked me for a nine o'clock inspection, what time did I show up? I showed up at 8.55. That never came back to bite me in any given day. I have six one hour periods. In any given day, I can give out a couple exact times. I would never give out more than one in any one hour window. And because we have good communications with, with each other, yes, we have our cell phones. And like in any typical business, hey, if you get hung up and you're not gonna be there, give me a call so I know. And I would do the same. That's me personally, not many people do that, but there's no reason that can't happen. Um, all right, and then we have a, a one one last um, question is for Don, and it's from Milton. Um, Don mentioned sticker flex as a sealant, but it is but it is good to relate that it is not a proper sealant for asphalt roofs. Yeah, there's a bunch of. Uh there's a bunch of things that don't go good together. If you take Cicaflex and put it, put it next to Vegetane, you're going to wind up with black jelly. I just said that looked like Cicaflex because it was a white color, and I assumed it was going down on, under that clay tile roof. But yeah, you're absolutely right. There are products that you definitely don't want to mix together. But ultimately, if again, when they do a re-roof on stuff, we don't ever go out and watch how they're putting the flashings down. Like Sparky said, most people just aren't inspecting these sort of things. And now somebody comes along and they're going to put a PV system down and we're going to, we want to regulate everything. We want to look at everything on that house with a fine tooth comb and we're not doing these, we're not doing these things for other, for other things. I mean, the same, the same inspectors that are being really hard asses about PV systems will just walk up to a water heater and treat it like their old friend. They, you know, but the thing can blow your house up. It's far more dangerous than a PV system, but we're familiar with that. So familiarize yourself with the products, and part of that is familiarize yourself with what can and can't go together. But as far as if that guy takes Cicaflex, puts it down on a roof, and creates black jelly, and that roof leaks, they're not going to call the building department. They're going to call that roofer because he's going to have to provide a warranty for his work, and it's going to leak. Ultimately, yeah, people are going to make that mistake. I'm sorry I said Cicaflex. I said that because it was basically the same color as white as Cicaflex was. I don't know what that product was. Sorry, Milton. Thanks, Don. All right, so before we wrap up today's webinar, we'd like to let everyone know that we will be hosting these webinars on a frequent basis to share all our SEAC recommended practices. In April, we will be presenting on methods to reduce follow-up inspections for small residential rooftop solar energy systems, so please stay tuned. By the way, our recommended practices can be found on our SEAC website under Our Work. Our website address is on the slide that's showing on your screen www.seacgroup.org. 
we welcome you to sign up and get involved. An email will be sent to all attendees with today's presentations and a link to the recording of the webinar. We thank all our speakers, Hector, Sparky and Don, and to you the audience for attending today's webinar. Thank you and have a great day. Hi everybody.